The police set out immediately after receiving a panicked call. After a few hours, they find Joseph's moped at the side of the road. It's dark, so they bring out their torches and start scrutinizing the area as best they can. The moped has stopped beside a bank that runs down to the beach, so they go down and check that out too. This horrific tale begins in Corsica in the 1960s, a little fishing port called Propriano. It's absolutely picturesque. The man they are looking for is Joseph Casabianca. He is the local fisheries guardian and his wife is worried about him because his boat is in the port, but his moped has gone. She has a sick feeling in her stomach. Her instincts tell her that something isn't right. As the police make their way down the bank towards the beach, they see a body. It's not moving and they recognize him immediately. It's Joseph. He has been shot, that's clear from the get-go. But they find his body has also been violently beaten. His skull has been crushed. And next to the body lies a hunting rifle cartridge with some weird green debris scattered around. It looks like paint. And we will soon discover that he has been finished off with repeated blows from a hunting rifle that had been painted green. Everyone knows Joseph in the town. Everyone likes him, so who would want to kill him? The fishermen? Or maybe some poachers that he had to cross? But everyone knows that he wasn't really the kind of guy to get in the way of poachers' business. Or at least, thus far in his career, he had never brought a complaint forward about poachers in the bay. And there were a lot. Pretty quickly, some rumours began to surface, all pointing to one man. A man who had been brought up in the town, in a big family. Thomas Rako, who everyone called Tommy. And just to warn you, this story is gonna get a little bit weird. If you're superstitious, you will totally understand. But if you're not superstitious, you might be by the end of the story. Because this family, Tommy's family, had a curse. But we'll get back to that. Joseph... Casabianca is Tommy's godfather. And him and Tommy were very close. So close that Tommy even carried Joseph's casket at the funeral. And other than a couple of rumors, there is very little evidence pointing towards the fact that Tommy had murdered his godfather. Except that Tommy notoriously had a painted green rifle, which now has disappeared. This case goes cold. A month goes by and the guys working on this case have nothing. Until Tommy's brother, Pierre, visits the police station with some information. He knows exactly what happened to Joseph Casabianca and he is ready to tell them everything. On the night Joseph had been murdered, he was with his brother Tommy and they were up to no good. They were poaching and they were poaching big time. They lit sticks of dynamite, threw them into the water and literally blew the fish out of the sea. You might not be surprised to discover that this is illegal, very illegal. That is why when they see someone watching them from the shore, Tommy loses his calm. It's Joseph and he's watching them like a hawk. Tommy orders his brother Pierre to go and hide himself down in the boat's cabin. Then he accelerates at speed towards the shore. He jumps off the boat and Pierre hears some arguing and screaming and then a shot. Tommy gets back in the boat. They head back out to sea and at just the right moment, Tommy throws the green painted rifle into the water. The police arrest Tommy and he admits everything. The poaching, the fight, the brutal beating he had given to his godfather, even down to the last detail where he crushed his skull with a giant heavy rock. His sentence is likely to be particularly severe because of the excessive violence that was used. Everyone in this town knows the Rako family. They are the biggest fishmongers in the town and they are a hard working family. The dad being the main fisherman and the mum who everyone affectionately knows as Mama Reiko running the shop. They have a lot of work on their hands, but on top of that, they have 11 children. I don't know how she could even walk after giving birth to 11 children, let alone run a shop. They have seven boys and four girls, or I should say had, because this family has had its fair share of tragedy. They had lost one of their kids as a baby and another boy recently had died in a tragic car accident and now their son Tommy has just killed his godfather. This is why when Tommy retracts his guilty plea just a couple days later, everyone is somewhat relieved for this poor fishmonger, hardworking family who have been through so much already. Everyone really wants to believe that Tommy is an innocent man. However, the judge is not convinced. So Tommy is sent to court to be tried for his crime. And the risk he faces is the death penalty. 
a lot of people show up to this trial. Friends, family, pretty much the whole village. And a lot of people are kind of hoping for a light sentence. But in 1962, Tommy is sentenced to death. He will face the guillotine. Yeah, they still did that in the 60s in France. They were big into head removal. However, for once, the Reiko family has a stroke of luck. After being sentenced, Tommy is given a kind of presidential pardon by Charles de Gaulle and his sentence is lightened. Instead of facing the guillotine, he will just face a life sentence in prison for which his family are relieved. So let's get down to the details of this mysterious Reiko family curse. The reason everyone thinks this family is cursed is because in 1920, a giant turtle washed up on the shore in Propriano. Now, if you don't know, there are tales and fables and stories of just how sacred an animal these turtles are. Many people consider them a symbol of luck and longevity and wisdom. So inevitably, everybody wanted to put this centuries old guy back in the sea to continue his long and happy existence. And why would they want anything else when they fully understand the sacredness of this creature? Everyone wants to put it back except one man who comes over with a saw in his hand and slices his head clean off. The shock. But it gets worse. He scrapes out the flesh and removes the shell. And for the next few decades, every one of his 11 children will silently sleep in the hollowed out shell of the wise old turtle. This fact, paired with the rest of the details coming up, have given rise to the spooky legend that still haunts the Reiko family to this day. The people of Propriano believe that the Reiko family has been cursed. Cursed for what Papa Reiko did to the turtle all those years ago. So you might not believe in curses or superstition, but let's just work through the details of what's happened to this family. In 1973, Ernest Reiko, who is probably the most famous of the Reiko family, he's famed for his expertise in deep sea diving and coral fishing. Ernest is coming back from a long dive with his brother-in-law. They begin to quarrel over something and a gun is drawn. Ernest runs into a phone box to try and call the police and at that moment, his brother-in-law shoots through the phone box and kills him. And it continues three years later. Pierre Reiko, who you will remember handed Tommy into the police initially, is attacked on a beach and violently beaten by two hooded men. It's allegedly some sort of revenge attack, potentially to do with a love affair. He dies due to his injuries. And not very long after that, Francine Reiko, who it was her husband who had shot Ernest in the phone box, she falls in the stairwell. A complete freak accident, but she dies. So if you have lost count, just to recap, there was 11 children that had used the turtle shell as a cradle as they were growing up. Five of them have now died far before their time. I can imagine this is quite difficult for Mama Reiko. And the sixth, Tommy, who has just been saved from the guillotine will now spend the rest of his life behind bars. But this is France and I'm sure you're beginning to notice by now that when people are supposed to spend their life behind bars, they really don't spend their life behind bars. After 17 years of being in prison, he is released. He is free, but he is under strict instruction to never set foot in Corsica again. So he gets a job in Marseille delivering deep sea diving gear across the south of France. And he is really liked by his colleagues. Even his boss loves him. They might not have loved him so much if they knew about his devious past or the fact that he was stealing consistently from the company. It's 1979, it's Christmas time, and a small supermarket is about to face the worst supermarket tragedy in French history. Three masked men walk into the store whilst the customers are still shopping in the middle of the day. They make their way directly over to the entrance of the money room. Two of them stay outside and guard the door. The third goes in. As usual, at this time of day, there are three girls counting the takings. The masked man forces them to hand over all of their money, which comes to roughly 100,000 euros. He then mercilessly shoots each one of them in the head and leaves. An observation is quickly made from the clear movements and timing of the robbers. They knew the supermarket and they knew it well. So is it an employee or an ex-employee or someone who knows one of the employees? The case lies cold until three weeks later. In a small village called Gakiran, three bodies are found covered in blood in a house. Gilles Le Goff, his 11-year-old daughter Sandrine, 
and the neighbour had all been shot in the head. And some shocking information is discovered in this case. Sandrine, the 11 year old daughter, had made a phone call just before being shot. She had desperately tried to contact her mother at work but her mum had already left for the day. Instead it's her mother's boss who answers the phone. Sandrine tells her in a brave and panicked manner that her father is in imminent danger. She states in the phone call that her father is being attacked by Rene's cousin and he's so angry that he might kill her father. And so her mum's boss tries to help as best she can. There's no mobiles back then so she pulls out the yellow pages and searches for the neighbour's number. She gets hold of him and the neighbour goes round to the house to check that Sandrine's okay and this is how he too ends up being shot. The neighbour here would have had to be incredibly heroic. He would have heard the first gunshot and still gone to check everything was okay. Not all heroes wear capes. He was called Monsieur Coutrix. So Sandrine in her last phone call gave a name to the police in this investigation, René, René's cousin. They arrest the three Renés that Sandrine would have known. They run investigations on all of them and come straight to Tommy, René's cousin. And Tommy from the beginning of this case is the number one suspect. Tommy is placed directly in custody, but he wholeheartedly denies anything to do with this crime. He states he's never even been to the village of Carquiran. In an attempt to provoke a reaction from him, they show him a picture of the 11-year-old Sandrine who was killed in this murder, but they get absolutely nothing from him. 36 hours of interrogation go by with absolutely no results, until the moment where he catches a glimpse of his cousin walking past his interrogation room. It annoys him and he asks why she's there, and they tell him she's there because of his crime. This gets to him and this is the moment he finally cracks, admitting committing the triple homicide. Monsieur Le Goff and him had been arguing over the sale of a gun. Le Goff did not want to sell Tommy the gun. And when things got heated, Tommy pulled out the gun he had brought to the meeting and pulled the trigger. Then to wipe out any witnesses, he shot the neighbour and he shot Sandrine. And he recounts all of these details with zero regret and zero remorse. Just the cold-blooded facts. Including the fact that when he wants to kill, he puts a bullet in someone's head. And when he wants to make someone suffer, he just shoots them in the knee. Like a line from The Godfather. Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. He's not Italian, he's Corsican, but when you look into the history of Corsica, you do discover that there is some Italian influence. The following day, he takes it all back. This is his thing, confess, then deny. He did the same thing with Joseph Casabianca. And he alleges the reason he confessed was that he was coerced into it, abused physically and worse. They had apparently shoved a broomstick up his posterior to humiliate him and thus he makes a formal complaint but there's only one way to find out if what he's saying is true and i'm betting that if he knew this he would never have made the claim in the first place he is subjected to a thorough medical investigation they check everything and find nothing concrete to suggest his allegations are true it's at this point that the police notice the similarities between this case and the case in the bezier supermarket both cases have three victims each with one professional hit like shot to the head they are convinced that the supermarket killings were done by tommy too but they have no evidence and since he just retracted his other confession it's not that likely that he's going to confess to a new murder a ballistics expert is pulled into the investigation to scrutinize the evidence for both cases and Bingo! The same gun was used in both triple murders. Then in 81, new evidence comes forward after an article was published in the paper about the supermarket killings. A man named Mr. Mafra claims he was at the supermarket that day and he recognises Tommy's picture from the paper. He's convinced it was the man he saw in the supermarket that day because of his blue eyes. So the lawyers want to organise a lineup where he will come in and try and identify Tommy out of a bunch of suspects. But Tommy's lawyer puts an abrupt stop to it because he states that his picture has been all over the papers and anyone, even if they weren't at the supermarket that day, could pull him out of a lineup. So they can't use this technique in evidence. But they do discover that Tommy had delivered a diving suit to the accountant in the Bezier supermarket. This is so important as it confirms that he does know the layout of the supermarket, where the cash was and at precisely what time it was being counted. 
as his defense team, Tommy hires a lawyer who is called the Silver Fox, Paul Lombard. Lombard has an excellent reputation. One of his high profile cases was the Little Gregory case in which he defended the grandparents of Little Gregory. Lombard states that just on the basis that the same gun was used in both triple murders does not prove that Tommy pulled the trigger. The supermarket case could have been someone else. There were three robbers there after all. Really though? You're not the run of the mill asshole, are you, Jim? You're a special kind of asshole. This trial is so chaotic. To start, there is a very angry mob of people waiting for Tommy to arrive at the courthouse. And Tommy, whilst he's been waiting in jail for the trial, has grown his hair and looks remarkably like as he steps out of the van, people begin screaming, death penalty, give him the death penalty. And the trial is a whirlwind of emotion. Of course, you have the Rako family there, or who is left of the Rako family, and the six victims' families. A mama Rako takes the stand, describing the tragedy that her family has been through and stating that she believes her son is innocent. She begs the court to be kind. Then one of the supermarket victims' husband takes to the stand. As he is giving his testimony, Tommy starts singing that song that goes parole, parole. But you know the one I'm talking about. He is showing complete disrespect to the victim's family and his behavior continues to be extremely despicable. Frustration and anger build so much that someone throws a shoe at Tommy. Then the court orders a reenactment of the supermarket killing. Everyone goes to the supermarket and Tommy refuses to get out of the van because he is innocent. So how can he reenact it? Then back in the courtroom, when Tommy takes to the stand to give his testimony, he claims he's innocent. Innocent just like Jesus Christ. Because of this ludicrous behavior and these ludicrous statements, his lawyer tries to plead insanity. Test after test after test is done on Tommy and he is found sane of mind and the trial continues. One of the psychiatrists who had analyzed Tommy, when he's asked if Tommy is a serial killer, he states, no, he's not a serial killer in the typical sense that we understand serial killers. He doesn't get a kick out of killing people. He kills people only when they're in his way or obstructing him from doing the thing that he needs to be doing. Serial killer or not, Tommy is given life in prison. And he now holds the record for the man who has spent the most amount of time in prison in history in France. On many occasions, he has attempted to appeal his sentence, but they have always been denied. His last effort was in February 2022 when he tried to appeal for medical reasons. It was again denied. He is now over 80 years old, but the family of his victims feel their pain like it was yesterday. And one man stated that he will dedicate his life to making sure Tommy is never freed from prison. His name is Guy Morel, and he has turned up to every single one of the appeal trials, making sure to fight to keep him behind bars. He also asks for Tommy to give him some sort of monetary compensation for the loss of his wife. Tommy really hasn't given him much money. In any case, there is little hope of Tommy ever getting out of prison. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, you need to show remorse for the crimes you've committed. And of course, he can't show remorse because he claims he's innocent. Secondly, the fact that Tommy's own son claims that Tommy has expressed that he will get revenge on the people who put him in prison. This for someone who's killed so many people, doesn't look great. And the third reason is that Guy Morel is always there fighting to keep him in jail. And this goes a long way in a trial. So that's where we are with Tommy. There's a couple other things about the curse that I have not yet mentioned. In 1982, Antoine Rico, one of Tommy's brothers, is condemned to 30 years in prison for a double murder. Two young girls who were traveling around Corsica. Then there is the death of Mama Rico. She died in Lourdes. And Lourdes is the most holy place in France. This may all mean nothing if you're not superstitious, but if you have been brought up a Catholic, this is kind of weird. That is all for this week and our thoughts and prayers go out to all of the victims in this case. There's so many. If you're new then please do feel free to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you want to know when our next video is coming out and the like button, that one too. And until the next time please stay safe, take care of yourselves. Bisous, à la prochaine.